So the vice president has just landed at the Mahikoni Technical and Vocational Institute and his intent here today is to see jobs for residents here. Is it so urgent and 
where now and in the future. We believe that a lot of the jobs that we lost in the period 2015 to 2020 were a result of a visionless approach to national development. A lot of the policies that were put in place in that period, they led not to the creation of jobs. And I believe ultimately any government should be in office to create the conditions for the creation of jobs. But that, in that period, we lost about 35,000 jobs. And I wish that you yourselves look at the analysis because it's important that you understand why we lost those jobs. So in the sugar belt, we lost 7,000 jobs. And that was clearly as a result of government decision, a callous decision to close the sugar industry without creating alternatives. I was in Verbeek and I launched a similar program. And the biggest impact of that, the closure of the sugar industry has been on Region 6. Because the entire region, whether you're a sugar worker or not, depended on the disposable income from sugar workers. And once that huge disposable income was withdrawn from circulation, it led to almost a collapse of the regional economy here. And so we lost 7,000 jobs here. And we lost a ton of jobs in mining and the forestry sector, generally in agriculture and other areas because of the policies. For example, a 14% tax was put on machinery and equipment. Now, if you want investments, because it's through investments that you create jobs, you need to create favorable conditions for investments. But if you're going to put a tax on factories and machines and everything else, then it's inimical to, to that development. And so when that happened, we saw a major reduction in investments. And in the, in, the, in the forestry sector, in 2020, we are reducing half of what we are producing in 2014. Mining output strong and the jobs strong. Retail trade strong. So we lost, as I said before, 35,000 jobs. Here in this region, which is predominantly agricultural, the same policies affected people negatively. For example, many of the farmers in the MMAC, they were confronted now with a new taxation regime for land and water charges. So when they were paying like $3,500 per acre per annum, that was increased to $15,000 per acre per annum. Now, agriculture is already very marginal. So if you do that, then you know what will happen. You make a marginal activity even less profitable. And that was the situation. That's just one policy that affected, say for example, this region. We, we made a commitment that we were going to reverse a lot of things. So that happened, we lost 35,000 jobs. And then in the period, in the COVID period, the shutdown of the COVID, we lost another maybe 40,000 jobs. So in our manifesto, we said that in the five years, we're going to create the conditions to create 50,000 jobs. But that number now is more than double. We have to create about 100,000 jobs in this, in this period if we want to just make sure that we can keep pace with the growing demand for jobs. And we will work in and listen at a plan to do this. Now, almost two years, since we assumed the office in August 2020, we could not do much on the ground. For example, two months ago, this gathering here would have been illegal. We couldn't bring people together because it was illegal to do so because of COVID. 
it's only two months ago we removed all the restrictions. And so we have spent a lot of time on building up the planning and deployment capability. And if you see what their strategy is, the strategy has been, first of all, to address the pandemic, but at the same time keep the country open. Because we have done so, we have now returned a lot of the, the temporary loss in jobs that many people have had because of COVID. Secondly, we have decided to reverse most of the policies that we put in place. So we have now reversed the tax on machinery and equipment, the lunch and water charges. We have reversed the fat on electricity on the water, which adds to the cost of input. We have reversed that on almost everything that fat was placed on. So, so this has had limited some form of success. That is why we have gone across the country now, launching this initiative with the hope that people will have at least a part-time job until the major plan is rolled out. Now, you would have heard a lot of things said about this program. For example, The so you would have heard a lot about this program. When I came back from, from Linden, where we employed about a thousand persons, the same as in this region, but now I've seen that the applications on this region far exceed the 1,000 limit that we have put in place. So on the way down here, I was looking at it, we will probably have to return to the region because to, to get a number of people on the program who did not get on the program. So I did, have not discussed this with the minister as yet, but I was just looking through the numbers when I was coming here. And I saw that a number of people had applied. You you fortunate that you're in the first wave, but if we, we we cut, cut off now, then the others who have applied will not get onto the program. And there is a sufficient number who have applied and did not get onto the program that warrants us increasing the numbers in Region 5. And this just mirrors the lack of opportunity in this region, which I'm going to talk about, like in some other regions. But I was telling you, we came back from Region 10, in Linden. First of all, the opposition was saying that the program was just a promise, it will never happen. That's what they told the people in Linden. When, and then secondly, they don't want part-time jobs, they want full-time jobs. This is coming from a party that didn't create a single job in Linden in the entire five years. A single job. And, and you know, Linden supports Africa. And it didn't create a single job there. In fact, what happened is that we had built a call center there that was operational until 2015. That was shut down by, by the last government. 18 persons lost their jobs. So this coming from a party that didn't create any jobs, to say they don't want part-time jobs, they want only full-time jobs, is not just callous, but, but ridiculous. Secondly, when the program was implemented and people were going to start working now, they came back and said this is a temporary thing. Well, it's not temporary. The job that you have here today, you are signing up to, is not a temporary job. It's a power time job. It will go beyond one year. Temporary jobs are for a small period, like, like maybe six months or a year or so. These jobs you have for a number of years and until we hope that you yourselves find better jobs or you upgrade yourself to study. So this, these are not temporary jobs. They have that from you. It's part-time. You work $40,000 a month, 
10 weeks in the month. 10 weeks you have to work. And you get 40,000 dollars a month. Our expectation is that the remaining 20 days that you will either study and you take advantage of the scholarship programs that the government is providing, which I'll come back to in a moment. And or look for better paying jobs. That is what the core expectation is. So we have seen many attempts to do this. And then the opposition leader and another one called my call, they were on a program and they were saying, what are the qualifications of these people? What are the qualifications to get these jobs? The last, I addressed that when I spoke in Burmese. The only qualification for this program is being diagnosed. That, that is all we need. Now we don't need any special qualification. And I wonder, some of the people that they, those MPs, the same MPs, I wonder what their qualifications were to become MPs because they put a terrible job in the parliament. But they question now an initiative why are people qualified to be part of this initiative? Now this initiative is to give people an opportunity so they get an income while they're studying or looking for something else. And they're going to be about 10,000 diamonds. In this country, you probably have only about maybe 200, 200 here. So imagine what 10,000 looks like. Um, so so 10,000 of our people working through this program. So I, I hope that all of you make full use of the, this program. This is not free money. This is not free money. You have to work for 10 minutes. But we will ensure that you are placed in a manner that minimizes you having to travel and all of that sort. So when we designed the program, we designed it in a manner where you can be placed in government facilities closest to you and even private facilities that perform a social function. So if you have a daycare, we may assign some people to a daycare because you can better serve our children. Now, I've, I've said this elsewhere, many people complain about government. They say, when I go to a government office, people don't pay attention to, to anything. When they're busy doing something else, they're not attentive, they're going to take care of people. Well, from today, you are going to become employees of the government, you have a government job. Don't do the same thing. The same thing that you don't want, you, I hope that you go there and wherever you serve, you take that attitude that I have to give you the full 10 days of service to the community that I'm serving. So wherever you are placed, if you're placed at the hospital or at the school to help out or in the NBC or, or in a daycare closest to you, that you give to the maximum. Because this job is designed to help you but also to help the community, to help you serve the community from, from which you come. So let me go back a bit to a few of the promises. One of the key promises we made before the elections is about education. That we wanted to make the University of Guyana um, free within the five years. So we're on track to do that within these five years in office. We're going to fulfill that promise. The University of Diana will become free. Secondly, we said we wanted to do 20,000 online scholarships. So the first year, we did 6,000. This year, you're on track to do about four or 5,000. And they have now launched a remedial program which if you have not completed the, or you don't have not secured the entrance requirement for the technical or the, 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 the other tertiary level training, that you can do this and then advance to the other programs. Now I've made it clear where 
tobacco. The 20,000 that we promised before the election is not the limit. Because the way we're going, we probably reach that limit by next year. That and as many people that we can find who want to study, the government will pay for their scholarship. And so this is an aggressive program that we are rolling on because we want to see all of our people being able to upgrade themselves. This is a requirement for the, for the future type of economy we have. Now, Professor Obadiah is here, um, and the key, you understand that? So that you can see Professor Obadiah heads that program. He is a former vice chancellor of the University of Guadalajara, brought him back to head the program for his online scholarships. And he's been working aggressively at that. So we expect all of you here. You don't have to, it's not compulsory, but we hope that you make use of these opportunities to study. Because you're gonna be able, there'll be a hand-holding process. We're not just gonna leave you on your own. We can we can guide you through this, through that unit and through the other ministries. So this is very important for us and I hope it's important for you. The type of economy that we will have in the future would require people to operate at a significantly higher level. And what type of economy will that be? Now you've heard a lot about oil and gas. And so before this is something Every year you speak in open, if you go on social media, you see every single person, whether they are sensible or not, they have an opinion on this matter. The foreigners are weighing in, telling us what to do, and many, many of them are guided by their own interests, not the interests of this country or its people. They're trying to steer us in a particular direction. We have many people who are Ghanese, but I don't believe they have a sense of where the country is going, nor do they care anything about people outside of their small circles, these, these middle class circles that are based often in the city, and they have these seminars at the Maria Terrestre where they can pontificate a lot but they will never come on the ground and listen to real people. So they have some, some views on the oil and gas sector that would see in fact many of them of course calling on us to shut it down now. So you have to navigate a very complex and very uh, um, environment, media environment that has a whole range of views. And for you to be discerning, it means you have to read a lot, you have to understand about the economic history of this country, forget the political history of the country, but even the economic history of the country. And so I hope you will get seduced by what seems popular, but is unsustainable policy. Take for example, the last government took away a $10,000 grant from the kids, every school child that had that grant when they got into office. They claimed they couldn't afford it. Now, is that true? Or is it that they had a different priority? If you go to the estimates that are presented in the budget at the budget time every year, by all, every year, by all, all parties. Go to the budget in 2014 and the one in 2020. And look at one item called dietary in government. That is food supplies to government, officials, etc. And see by how much it grew. It grew by over 1.6 billion dollars. That is more food supplies of government. 
we had 167,000 kids in school in 2014. At $10,000, that's $1.67 billion. So the government increased food supplies to government by 1.6, but, but couldn't afford the 1.6 to pay the grant to the school kids. It was just a matter of priority, and that could be very fine. It could be very fine. So then they couldn't afford 10,000 10, dollars, but today the same opposition is saying, let's give every Guyanese 5,000 US dollars per year from the oil and gas money. Now, first of all, if there are 800,000 of us and we get 5,000 each, that's 4 billion US dollars per annum. We've collected 350 million dollars, nearly 12 times less than they want us to give out. But it sounds very popular. I've seen people holding up black cards, they want the $5,000. So it sounds like a people like free money, anyone would like, like some free money, a double, a million dollars every year you get for free. It is nonsensical. This is the same policy. First of all, it is, it sounds good, but if we pursue it, will take us back to the past. And the past is that many of you were young, so you don't know that past, but you were burdened by the past. Because there was a time in the early 90s when the debt of this country was one of the highest in the world, largely because of those policies. After three decades of undemocratic rule, that is what the result was. And the service that debt took up 153 percent of the revenue. So we have that. We spent the last 20 odd years clearing off that debt, and even before oil and gas. Today, it's one of the lowest in the world. There's 16 percent of the GDP, and about six percent of revenue goes to pay for it. But why? That meant a lot of sacrifices. That meant a lot of loss in government over the period. We had to repay billions of dollars of, for resources that were unsustainably used. So we will, we can't go back to that future. We can't in the future go back to, to those policies. If that is why fiscal discipline, carefully thought out policies are important if we want to get wealth. And we can do so in the future, but it requires a lot of hard work. Right now, we're only collecting about $350 million per annum from the oil and gas. It will grow steeply in the future, but that's what we're collecting. Well, um, two projects alone. The bridge across the Damar River will be 260 million US dollars. That's a four-lane bridge, massive high-rise bridge. The six new hospitals that we're building across the country, that's the coast, will cost 180 million US dollars, 30 million each. We one the maternal and child children hospital, 175 million dollars. So because that will be a high-end hospital for children and women. So if there is any complication, they can get some of the best services in the world. So if we look at those three sets of projects alone, then you would see that almost all the money that we've collected in the first two years and go we'll into those three projects. We didn't use oil and gas money until about two, two, three weeks ago. Two weeks ago, that's the first time money came to the budget from the Natural Resources Fund. So if you hear the leader of the opposition a year ago, he has gone to the people in Lyndon and told them he'd be sharing all the oil money everywhere else, but they're not getting it. It's not true. It is not true. 
because you can verify the first trying to release him from the natural resources fund over to the budget just a few weeks ago. So, so I expect you to read a lot about these things. So you're going to hear all sorts of things coming I mean, on. That future is one where we have to work hard. The government has made it clear that there are some areas where we are going to spend oil and gas money. We spend it on our children. So we have now, we, on our manifesto, we promised not just to return the $10,000 grant, but to take it to $50,000 per child per year. This year it's already at 25000 and it's allocated. We've doubled, more than doubled the school uniform grant from 2000 to 5000 So in just the two years, we sent the double old age pension because we want to spend it on our elderly. So we have double old age pension in, in the five years. Already in the first two years, we've increased it by 40%. That's where we're heading on the social side. We're spending more on people with disabilities, um, making sure that in each region we have a facility that can manage or provide services to them, children with special needs. So these are the groups, single parents, that will get a lot of help from us. That is children, the elderly, people with disability, single parents, these are targeted interventions that they are welcome to. Secondly, we will spend a lot of the resources on education and on health, world-class health. I mentioned to you education, I mentioned just a few things that are going to happen in the health sector, but we have a major plan. Because we believe if we have healthy, educated population, then they can do function well in the new economy of the future. Then another area for, for resources to be spent on will be infrastructure. So you see the highways are going to be built, port facilities, a power plant that will be by 2024 bring the gas in, generate power. So then we don't we right now we don't have enough power to supply the, the country because a big project, the Milan Fall Hydro Power Project was killed by Adam. They didn't replace it with anything else. So right now our peak demand is very close to install capacity. And um, and therefore people have some wherever we go street lights and stuff. I, I said it for a reason. We don't have enough power even to supply the homes. That's what we're struggling with now. But by 2024, when we, the gas oil plant start, start when the pipeline will be built, that many people, the same few fringe elements are opposed to, and, and um, they, they will generate close to 250 to 300 megawatts of power that would allow us to cut the electricity prices by 50%. So this will make a big difference. That's where the, the resources and infrastructure will go. And then, and then, of course, we do some to diversify the economy. I've talked about that in greater detail. And then save some through the southern platform. That's where oil and gas and money will go in the future. It's offline and it's part of our plan. We don't have enough money to give everyone a handout. You have to work hard for the future. Um, don't listen to people who tell you one commentator on TikTok is saying, we're so rich now we should stop working and just wait at home to um, receive money. I keep saying, even in the United States of America, we have our capital GDP of $72,000. We have like, ours is nine, and then we have three jobs at eight. Three different jobs we do work as we move here. Here, we must stop working. So don't listen to that. Now in this region, they're going to be outside of this program, the park, the hospital, the hospital built, etc. We're looking at a major investment in, 
in a full range of activities on the agricultural sector. So expansion of agricultural, the livestock industry, and then on the other end, here on this end, at least you are very fortunate that you're closer to Region 4. And you know in Region 4, if you, if you need a job in that region, Region 3 and 4, if you have like 500 people here, I can find jobs here. Many people are looking now for labor that they can't find. So four and three are getting a lot of jobs because of what we the oil and gas sector, because of the hospitality industry, about six, seven major new international hotels being built, a lot of many um, housing schemes and all of that. So they practically run out of labor. I can talk any contractor you need, the biggest complaint to make is I don't have laborers. Laborers. I don't have laborers. I can't find people to work. That is in the region four and, and part of it. The problem is when we get out to region two and ten and five and six, that's when we have more people because the many are agricultural base or like a ten mining base. And then, of course, the hinterland regions. And so, at this end, if some of you want to work and can travel to work in four, we can find more jobs in you. And we can do some training programs too outside of the one that the scholarship program, right here, to give people, especially young people, and, and I do um, like electrical services are badly needed, electricians, plumbers, masons, these things are short term courses where people are now making eight, nine thousand dollars a day just like in one of these areas. It can be even more that you're making. So if you have, say, from my pony going back um, to maybe my in the region. You have people here, they may be able to travel easy to Georgetown. And if you want to do some of these training programs, maybe not you or, or others who you know, we can then work to even at this the technical institute right here to put in place some of these short term programs that will get you up to a skill level and certify you. And then you, you can make more 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 um, you can get the job set, but you may have to travel. You know, on the other end, we're looking at making sure that there is a massive investment in the other part of Region 5 in the in the Barbies. Up to yesterday, we had a discussion, the president was involved, everyone, about how we use the Barbies River in a similar manner that we're using the Damar River to trigger a series of investments that will create thousands of new jobs for the oil and gas and other sectors and linking that with, with, with Brazil. If we, if we succeed here, you're going to have thousands of new jobs created. Just across the river, Palmyra, there will be a new cricket, uh, well not cricket, but a new stadium being built before the end of the year. Major international hotels. So as soon as you cross the bridge, eventually we have to replace that bridge with a four-lane high, high bridge like we're doing across the Yamar River. So there, there are lots of plans for this region too, that will see people getting higher-paying jobs and jobs in different centers. But it's right now it's harder to get. The investors to locate in the region, they all want to go to region three and four. That is across the river, on the other side of the Namara River, and then on this end, because that's where a lot of activities are taking place. In fact, more activities that we can handle on the East Bank corridor. So the idea is to shift, shift a bit, a bit out, out of these areas. I, I hope. I'm, I'm, I'm not here to make any big speech and to talk about, you know, the lofty things. It's more 
practical difficult just to talk to you about these things because they matter. They matter. When we are busy, we um, although the pandemic thwarted our efforts, we can really be busy. We still have some of the after effects of the pandemic, you know the cost of living as well, although we remove all the taxes we promised because the factories around the world that supply countries like ours are shut. China, the US, etc. So once the factories are not producing the things we are importing, we can't get or the prices go up. A lot of that has triggered and then the war in Russia and the Ukraine has pushed up oil prices to a level that is unbelievable. So prep oil prices move from $28 a barrel for crude in 2015. It's now nearly $120. So that triggers everything. Fertilizer prices all increase. So we, we took off the tax on fertilizer. We took off the tax on the 50% tax on for, um, gasoline and diesel. But although we have done that, the prices are still on because of the situation globally. So we have to address that. Um, I, I just hope that you're following these issues too, because they're just as important. So I, I think maybe today I'm just going to do it different. I'm going to take more questions, Nigel, and then can get to, to some of the policy issues to the question. So, but thank you very much for being here. I, I hope that, as I said, at the very beginning, that you give me the very best in this, in this program. And, and, and some of the people who may have applied and didn't get onto this program, there's a possibility that within a week or so we can try to address them. But they're, from what I see, there are lots of people. And I expected that. Region 2 had the same thing. When Region 2 we said a thousand, and we ended up almost 2,000 people because they were relatively isolated. And, uh, Region 5, because it's an agricultural base, like Region 2, where people don't have many other opportunities for getting jobs, but the government offices are not here, they're all in Region 4, everything is almost based in Region 4, then people here would need this part-time job. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Yes, I will come to the place. I was hoping all of you would like, like to do this. It's not compulsory, you know. Once you get onto this program, you don't have to, so don't worry. It's not compulsory. But we are hoping that you all would want to, to do it. And then you can get us a scholarship too. For the government. I will tell you we have programs for each and every one of them. Even if just you are like a really big type of program we have and stuff. Yes, yes, that's the question. Well, I'm just sure. Okay. We're gonna leave some of the brochures here, so please um, please take me take these. You you have and you have some training programs right here too, right? In the technical institutes. We can then support your programs a bit by maybe getting some more resources to them so they can expand their programs, the training program. Okay. Um, but you've got to be a bit more aggressive, normal aggressive. I see your faces, you look like region five people. I go to the other region, people are more aggressive. No? I want to see more aggression. So you want to talk a bit about your program too? Give me the microphone. Okay, good morning. Yeah. Please, please, please. Let, 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 I, just one minute. Let, 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 let. Okay, so we have registration forms available for our new intake in September. And um, we're doing this is one year for persons who receive a CDQ uh, Caribbean Educational Qualification. And the programs we have available uh, mechanical engineering, sorry, motor vehicle engine system, carpentry. Electrical installation, metal work engineering, waste healing, motor vehicle repair, plumbing, welding, data operations, and general health and So, for persons who are interested, you can just select the form and select the form. But what I want you to do, since you've been working for government now, that you'll be coming from today once you sign up your government employees that you help to educate people in your villages wherever you come from about these programs too so that they can make full take full advantage. So get like some of the the, the uh, brochures, talk to people in your neighborhood, get them to be part of some of these programs. Part of maybe we should do something like that with those who are working on so for those of you who tuned into the Guyanese Clinic uh, live, I'm coming to you from Maikoni, uh, Region 5, where the Vice President and Ministers of Government are reaching out to citizens. Um, they're actually here delivering on jobs that were promised. Um, Ten days a week for four to thousand dollars a month and these persons will be placed in government offices um, in areas close to them a few hundred people are being signed up at this location this is the Maikoni Technical Institute and even the Technical Institute has programs starting come September that you could sign up you could come to the Technical Institute see what they have to offer and sign up because and get yourself um, educated for new jobs. So the guy needs to come into your life, look out for the next life from the next location. Working for government through this program. And we can take one thing of the 10 days. Many of you can help in your villages to go house to house with these workshops and say, go and get tested. And I will get tested for diabetes or hypertension or something. We can utilize their skill to get the information to people. And if we train you, then you can explain to people the complications when you have these things that they go unaddressed. Because it's becoming a big problem. So maybe we should utilize this scheme to help us with that, about raising awareness, about not just employment opportunities, training opportunities, but about people's health in their, in their villages that you come from. So it is something that I think we can, we can utilize people. Yeah.
Yes, yes. So you have the forms and stuff. Okay, so yeah. yeah. The BIG, we had a discussion with Minister Hamilton and we said to focus on the outline regions because it's, it, the training opportunities are not as great in the outline regions. So we're here. Yes, we're here. Okay. So and this program is uh, a start here, um, this month here. So starting this month. Now, Victor, you as a regional chairman, you and the RDO. Right? Yeah, you all need to go into the communities and get people. Don't, don't just wait here. Let us start taking this around and go and, and discuss this with you groups at the sport of um, clubs and everything else so we can get the information out. Now we usually start these programs and we don't want people who, who are coming in to be trained and it's for their own improvement. need to do that on the road. Okay. Is there anything else? Yes, you wanted to raise something. So, because of climate change, we now have to 
be prepared to manage larger volumes of water in shorter periods. On the say, for example, historically, the month of January will get seven inches of rainfall. Now, in one night, we can get seven inches of rainfall. So, greater intensity of rain and all of that. So our drainage systems have to evolve, but this will cost billions of dollars. This year alone, we are programming 130 million US dollars for these big projects, and then we we'll have another loan before the Islamic Development Bank. So these are major ones. What you're saying is at pumping capacity. We have 11, 11, yes. So cottage is being built, but we're bringing in 11 mobile pumps that you can deploy. When, you, when I was here in the region the last time when I launched this program, this was about a month ago when we came and we launched the program. The, um, we you raised these matters. So they said that they now are designing about these structures and they're going to go to ten years. But you know when government works, it has to go through a temporary process. That's not. So we we work here carefully here and we understand the situation. My suggestion the only solution for ICF will help me get more and and the product to be something. So, so as I explained at that meeting, we were thinking about stretching the mind of my colleague Barry. We have a lot of